Yes, welcome. This is F a Rap Critic. I'm your boy Malik16, and no, you don't know my steez, but the rep grows bigger, and it only gets better. Today is a very special episode. No, not because I'm sitting sideways, shout out to Paul Wall, but not only is the album that we're going over today turning 25 years old this month, but today, this very day, on this very channel, which I hope you all took a moment to like and subscribe to, happens to be turning two years old today. That means somebody out there loves us, and this is episode 40 in what is the 50th year of hip hop. So happy birthday, hip hop. You have made it possible for this channel to exist. Just like all of you dope, dope, dope viewers and subscribers, shout out to each and every one of you. The album that we're going over today is none other than the 1998 classic, Moment of Truth by the duo Gangstar. And with no delaying, we're just gonna jump right into the first dimension of category one, which is gonna be dimension one, the quality of the production. And now when you're talking about a duo like Gangstar, they make this dimension a little easy to sift through because they are such a self-contained act. You're gonna get the majority of the production helmed by quite arguably the most coveted, respected, and sought after DJ producer of the 90s, talking about the legendary DJ Premier. Another staple of Gangstar projects is gonna be the contributions on production from the other half of the duo, Guru, who I think maybe since the second album on a major label had started delving and dabbling into production and flexing his muscles in that arena since he went off to do his own side projects, which we'll talk more about later. But on this album, the two tracks where Guru leads the production are gonna be the songs She Knows What She Wants and Make Them Pay. Now with the majority of the rest being led by DJ Premier's production, what you're going to get is what's come to be associated with his name. DJ Premier has kind of made a second career as a YouTube presence with his series uh, Saluting the Floppy Disk, where on his channel he goes episode by episode, giving you the backstories of all these classic tracks that he's produced, both inside Gangstar and outside of Gangstar with other well-known acts or some lesser known acts. But nevertheless, you know, Premier, He's pretty careful not to give away, you know, if you go there looking for the actual tools of the trade and how he put the beats together, you're, you're gonna be highly disappointed because he's not giving that away. In, in essence, I believe the, the point of the episodes are to give you an idea of how the songs came together rather than how the beats themselves came together. But one thing that he is not shy about um, making note of is his use of two specific machines in his beat making process. It's gonna be the Akai S950 and the MPC60. Now there's been instances, there's some classic beats that he's made on other versions of the MPC, as well as the SP1200 from the really early days in the 90s. But for the most part, it's gonna be those first two machines that I mentioned. And we know that Premiere is famous for how he chops up samples and punches them in. There's a few instruments that he famously uses. Let's talk about some of the main sounds that you're gonna hear on this album between Guru and Premier's production. So for one, they're going to pull from their wealth of music knowledge and music love. We spent a lot of time in the previous episode talking about the era of hip hop where jazz was the leading sound and leading influence in hip hop production. Gangstar came right before that survived through it and became one of the pioneers of really manipulating that sound but keeping a gritty hip-hop essence and you know guru got to experiment more with the pure jazz sound uh in again his side projects with the jazz and Taz series but coming out of that you're still talking about two men who are heavily inspired and heavily into jazz music so naturally you're going to get a lot of jazz samples on this album and they're also pulling from soul. You're gonna get soul from some underrated spaces and lesser known artists and then some bigger names. So you're gonna get samples from groups like uh, Five Special and Lattimore, but you're also gonna get samples from acts like The Supremes and War on the flip side of that. And so we take some of the beats here 
and, and strip them down to their rudimentary elements. Beats like Robin Hood Theory, that's gonna come from a jazz sample. Beats like Above the Clouds, which is one of the standout album cuts here, another jazz sample. And they both use similar sounds. They both are pulling from these uh, plucky instruments. Naturally, you're gonna get a lot of horns and what Primo is famous for is his bells, chimes, it's kind of the running joke that Premier is going to use a bell or chime. One thing I've come to really appreciate about watching the episodes on Premier's channel, please check those out if you haven't already. Educate yourself on some dope, dope hip hop history from one of the legends, giving you the stories that only he can give you. Um, but one of the things that, that stands out to me is that on those episodes, and I don't know if it's purposely, because like I mentioned, Primo's not trying to give away his tools of the trade on there, but on the episodes, he doesn't even reference the instruments he uses by, by their musical names. Uh, he might not know them, but he reminds me a lot like me. You're going to hear him using words like, oh yeah, the chimey sounds or the blingy sounds. <laughs> so I'm like, yes, someone speaks my language. <laughs> I'm in good company. And so you're gonna hear those and another signature premiere is going to be the way he arranges his drums. We know he utilizes that MPC. And so that's gonna give you that muffled but hard drum sound, which has a warmth to it. If you grew up on boom bap, hip hop, I don't care what region you're from, for some reason, people look to DJ Premier's drums and his specific touch on production as being what hip hop should sound like. I made a track about this back in my mixtape days, kind of satirizing that fact that, you know, the purists would be so tunnel vision or, or tunnel, tunnel listening or tunnel, tunnel hearing <laughs> that if it didn't sound like premier production, they would kind of, or anything of that ilk, they would detach. But yeah, there's something that feels legit. And like I said, warming when you hear those signature premiere sounds, the bells, the chimes, and those drums. The drums are gonna be present on almost every track here, even the softer ones compared to the harder ones. It's also interesting to note that Google's contributions are two of the softer tracks on here. Even though what's done on Make Them Pay is pretty hardcore, the texture of both of those beats are on the softer side compared to B.I. versus Friendship or Next Time or Work, you know, one of those boisterous songs like that, even Royalty. But for the big, big production sounds you're gonna get here, there's gonna be bigger horns, there's gonna be wah-wah guitars on the funk-inspired stuff, there's gonna be piano keys on the more jazz-inspired stuff, there's gonna be harder snares where there's vocal samples and so on and so forth. So it's just a range of the sounds that you're gonna get at this point, you've heard Premier produce for a lot of hip hop luminaries and notables and making other hip hop classics. But the beats on here seem pretty tailored to Guru and they seem to fit with what Guru is gonna bring across. So all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five when you're thinking about the quality of the production on here. I know it sounds almost blasphemous to question the quality of Primo production, but there we are. Takes us to dimension two. We're talking about the cohesiveness of the album. All right, so let's see how easy this dimension becomes to peel back when we've already discussed that you're only getting production from two sources, the group itself. But sometimes that's not always a great thing, right? You want variety of sound. One of the appealing factors of the production here is that there is a range. And we're talking about a lot of songs here. There's 20 tracks on this album and for one producer to do 18 of those tracks. There's a natural fatigue that's going to set in, but amazingly, Primo pulls from all of the different sounds that you had heard from him in the span of his career up until that point, which had been about a 10 year career in the public. And so you're gonna hear subdued beats like Robin Hood Theory that are hollow but then you're also gonna hear these full soul samples like JFK to LAX, these pretty melodic beats like What I'm Here For, and then sinister beats like The Setup, and even some Southern sounding inspired beats 
like betrayal. And so you're getting that from beginning to end. Premier doesn't pull his foot off the gas. There's no teasing. There's no stop and start here. They're not coming out with their strongest production in the beginning and, and wavering at the end. There's none of that. It is a focus production effort from beginning to ending to the point where we're talking about the sequencing as always shout out to the executive producers and the artists themselves because the way things are lined up here your up tempo your energetic tracks come right when they're needed after the mellow tracks which i've referenced guru's production contribution being on the mellower side those are separated and put in a way where it's time for them right when they come in and so you get the bigger premiere production right after you get two tracks where one is experimental and one is the softer side of premiere. And that's kind of the triangular sequence of production that you get as the album goes along. You're going to get something that's a newer premiere sound, like Above the Clouds. You're not used to hearing beats like that from premiere up until that point in 1998 that was new but then something like work is familiar something like the rep grows bigger new york straight talk we've heard those kind of premier sounds before and then the the soul sample based stuff is just a mature sound for gangstar it's like the blending of the worlds of what Google was experimenting with on his own with jazz bringing it back to the gangstar fold uh, so tracks like the title track, Moment of Truth, JFK to LAX, She Knows What She Wants, they center the album and let you know that this is a season, super season iteration of the group where it's, it's giving you what you want a group at this point to give you. Something old, something new, something borrowed, something blue. That's kind of the best way to put it, but I mean that sequence is pretty, pretty on point sonically where there's no meandering but this is all something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to dimension three when we talk about the overall mood and tone of this album and so premiere has gone on record talking about struggles stresses and external pressures and internal strife and so he speaks about how the the impact of the four-year hiatus where Guru was working on volumes and volumes of Jazzmatazz and the Ill Kids compilation series and he had gone off producing for other acts as DJ Premier, it just changed the dynamic forever for how they worked together when it was time to come back to the Gangstar duo platform. And with that came fights behind the scenes, disagreements, and uh, they said they would get quality work done in between those but that was a big thing and so i think what shapes this album is the fact that they both loved the duo legacy so much that they were both committed to making a quality project primo says that he always just wanted to be respected for consistency the way that public enemy and epmd were because they at the time from the 80s going into the later 90s were known as being reliable groups or duos that you could go to and know you were going to get a solid quality project that's not going to lose its core audience right so this is a practice and how do you execute growth demonstrate growth without losing your core audience and come back from a four-year break trying to see if your core audience still exists the other elephant in the room which creates this undercurrent for the album is all of the legal issues that Guru had amassed at this point. We're talking about the airport incident where he had a gun at LaGuardia and then the assault charge involving a woman that said that he hit her over the head with a, with a bottle. These things they chose to address on the album which after a hiatus, a significant hiatus, is preferred practice. When you're making a quote-unquote comeback album, you, the public wants you to address what's been whispered about, what's been seen, and in this case, these are things that made the tabloids, the public record, the magazines, the newspaper. I remember reading about uh, the Guru charges and being like, what? And so the fact that 
the the album itself is shaped around it the cover the artwork and in some of the stories like jfk to lax and moment of truth it's addressed i, I want to say head on it's spoken about vaguely but it is addressed you can tell it's like okay here i'm speaking about this in other songs throughout the album it's knotted to with subtlety and so you hear the theme continue because of that and i think that adds to the cohesiveness because it's gonna get addressed on two tracks and touched on in other places, just so you don't forget, this is an undercurrent. This is why the cover art is in a courthouse in front of a judge. It's the moment of truth. And then you're seeing that it's playing off of this criminal justice courthouse theme in, in the photo shoot. So I think those are the main two themes with little bracketed segments underneath them that you could break down even further if you wanted to. We're, we're back, we're stronger than ever. We're giving you old and new. We're committed to this group. And along with that commitment theme, it's going to be this sentiment of loyalty that gets echoed throughout different songs on the album, like B.I. versus Friendship, My Advice to You, In Memory Of, where they're talking about real people, real friendships, uh, or just their ideologies on how you hold your people down and how long you hold them down through whatever circumstances. And they're speaking to each other as well. We're solid, they're bigging up each other all throughout the record. When, when Premier speaks, it's in alignment with what Guru is saying. And Guru doesn't hesitate to shout Premier out on several tracks. So you're hearing them not only talk about their commitment to the group, but also their commitment to their people. And you're getting that, we're back, we're still us, we're stronger, we're better. And yeah, underneath all that, yes, we are going to address what we've been up against. Even Premier has a talking interlude where he's addressing some of the issues and, and, and beefs he's had behind the scenes within the industry of people who have kind of outed their production techniques and his whole approach to using samples and things that would otherwise not be cleared the regular way and he's like, we're hip hop, we don't do that to each other. Uh, and so there's a lot of things being addressed on the album, whether it's vague or not, it's still being addressed. And it's not the vaguest, it's just at the same time, not the most direct, right? So all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. When you're thinking about the overall intentional mood and tone of the album, it takes us to dimension four, where we talk about the song distinction versus the repetition of words and sounds. With Premiere, because you're going to get those signature sounds, it's expected that you'll hear some of them used in different arrangements on different tracks. So yeah, you might hear a wah-wah guitar more than once. You might hear similar drums, but not the same pattern. And you might hear chimes, but different kinds of chimes. I, I, again, amazingly, on a 20-track album, he's able to tap into all of the production styles that he has showcased up until that point in his career. So you're getting sounds that he used on Biggie songs, sounds that he used on J. Rue songs, sounds that he used on Nas songs, sounds that he used on Digging in the Crate songs. So I, you're just getting that, as well as these nods to old Gangstar stuff. If you consider his use of vocal samples on hooks or at the beginnings and endings of songs to be redundant or, or lazy, then that's going to be something that's going to be a takeaway from consider the different spaces that he's taking vocal samples from on this album. He's using old movies. He's using pieces of JFK speeches. He's using clips from the original Superman series, the radio show or the 1930s, 1940s TV series. And he's also pulling one thing I've always, always admired about Primo's signature use of different vocal scratches is that it creates this equalizing platform where you're going to hear pieces of songs from megastars, well-known acts in the same song, perhaps as a sample from an underground artist who you may have never heard of. And so they get all cut in there just to make this one song pop. And it creates a whole new work. So uh, it's, it's a nod, it's an homage to everything that came before. Sometimes he scratches from songs that came out the same year, which always is super impressive. Shows you how much of a DJ he is. He had his hands on 
some of these tracks right before. But yeah, if you consider that lazy or repetitive, then yeah, that's going to be an issue for you throughout this whole album. Production-wise, there's just really not any beat on here that sounds like another, even if they're using the same family of instruments. Robin Hood Theory and Above the Clouds, I, again, I mentioned how they both use plucky instruments, but those arrangements are so different that you get different feels from them. Robin Hood Theory has a little bit more of a darkness to it, while Above the Clouds feels airy. Same thing with uh, Work and Next Time. They both use horns, but they use different horns. Work is the use of these blaring short horns, and Next Time are these drawn out dramatic horns. What, what Guru does on the mic, you're not gonna hear a lot of repeated phrases. He, uh, he may say the word MC, you may say kid a lot. Kid is his go-to uh, when he's talking to whoever he's talking to. Uh, but there's no, there's nothing he's branding here besides the Gangstar Foundation. So he's gonna shout out Premier. He's gonna shout out Gangstar. Um, there's a lot of 5% nation talk, but it's not too much where you feel flooded with it. It's in there very prominently but not in a flooding capacity. And so because there's nothing else that he's trying to brand in particular besides the duo itself and the name they would back, I, I think it'd be hard for you to find a repetitious factor here because even that is sprinkled throughout. It's not every track where he's like, we're gang star. That's not happening. And so all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats when you're thinking about the song distinction versus the repetition of words and sounds takes us to dimension five, the amount of content versus the amount of songs. 20 tracks on this album, and I mean 20 tracks, no interludes, just some songs that are shorter than others. Some songs are just two verses, like She Knows What She Wants or What I'm Here For. Those are gonna be shorter, but these are songs. <laughs> We're now in the era of rappers trying to one-up each other to see how long the album they make could be, who could do a double, who could do a triple album, whose packaging is the most niche. So we're there. And because this duo was coming back from such a long stint away, I imagine that giving quantity and quality was on their agenda. It's like, oh, we gotta give them more than a 12 song album. We gotta give them something they could chew on and make up for the lost time. They probably had this many songs in the canon. They probably had more songs than this that didn't make the cut. And so with that, you're considering how much is Guru saying on this microphone that's topical and substantial. One thing that you'll hear from the opening of this album is Guru describing the Gangstar formula and how it can only work if it's him and Primo together and putting their their skill set to a to concerted effort but then he also mentions there's always a message that's his uh his like concluding line before the beat drops on the first song you know my seeds so it's clear that message in the music is always going to be a part of the mission and you get that as soon as the second track rolls in robin hood theory you get okay i'm gonna get some jewels of knowledge in between the braggadocia and between all the other stuff. And so there's a substantive song for every two songs. That's kind of the ratio that you get here. If you know my C's is my comeback braggadocio song, the next song being Robin Hood Theory is pure topical. Let's squeeze the juice out from all the suckers with power and pour some back out so as to water the flowers. Like, that's where he's going. It even starts with a, a preachy moment by someone from the nation who's outright preaching, you know? <laughs> you know, whether it's Judaism, Buddhism, that's not keeping it real, that's keeping it wrong. There's no qualms made about that. You know, the title track is topical. Even a, a lighthearted subject matter, like the mall, fits in that topical basket because the performers are staying on that point. So I'd say a two to one ratio is pretty safe for every two songs that are just kind of braggadocio until like MCs don't 
mic skills and in competition, you're gonna get one song that is about something and it's gonna be unabashedly about something without the ambiguity. It's like, no, this is a song about a woman who knows what she wants. This is a song about New York and so on and so forth. And so it's up to you to determine if that is a fair ratio for a classic album, for an album of 20 songs, something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats that takes us to dimension six, the features. Oh, buddy. One thing about this album that I thought was an amazing feat also is how how important every performer on this album sounds. And that's a testament to Primo's production. It's also been said part of his legend and mythos is that he can make anyone sound good. Uh, this puts that to the test, but it's impressive at the same time that what this album does is bring a lot of names into the light that would not have gotten shine otherwise, no matter their different levels of notoriety or skill. The majority of their guests being older rap figures or unknown. And so when I say older, I mean been in the game for a while. They could easily grab whoever was the newest, youngest, and hottest. They went for the season polish or the dirty, grimy, unknown, right? So we're talking about veterans like Freddie Fox and Big Shook. Nowhere else besides the Gangstar album are you going to hear Big Shook. It just, his name had not been built up enough. He is a founder of Gangstar along with Guru before Premiere was even in the picture. But in the hip hop world, he's known as an associate of the duo Gangstar. Just couldn't be a part of the blowing up because he was incarcerated. And with that, you know, some of his rap skills were a little behind. But on Primo production, it sounds crisp. You're getting names that you've never heard of, like Hannibal, Shiggy Shop, and then you're going to get two names that had started making noise. Uh, we're on my radar for two different reasons. Crumb Snatcher, who winds up getting Hip Hop Quotable of the Month for his verse on Make Them Pay. Uh, I had become familiar with because at the same time or the year before he had released a single called Closer to God, where he detailed getting shot. He's a Boston rapper, and I just thought the way he described it, I never heard any rapper detail a street tale like that with reality. And I'm like, this is what they mean when they say reality rap. He didn't glorify anything. He told you how gutter and grimy he was leading up to experience. He told you how he felt in the moment, how the bullet felt going into his skin the aftermath and the consequences with the regret. That is how you do street rap. And so, Crumb Snatch is on my radar. The other figure whose name was bubbling is g Depp. This is the first record that I remember hearing g Depp on. Now, as a Harlem native, I remember walking around Harlem, seeing stickers with g Depp's name. This is pretty bad boy here. This is just g Depp. Stickers all over West Side of Harlem and me not knowing who the hell this is, but being like, okay, they want us to know his name. Seeing his name on this album made me tune in because I'm like, let me hear what this person is about. Now, did I really pay close attention like that? No, but it resonates now knowing who g Depp is and that this appearance is here and it speaks to what Gangstar does. Gangstar to underground hip hop is what the roots were to Philly performers, giving them a shot, giving them a platform. That is what Gangstar did. Then you get some of the more known names, again, still older artists in the game at this point, M.O.P. Famously, who add a lot of texture to a song like B.I. versus Friendship, and in my opinion, kind of get Guru to step it up a notch and he deliver one of his hardest verses on the album because of their level that they perform at. You have Scarface, probably the biggest feature on this whole album, because at this point he's a legend in his own right and their equal status in the game. And it's a combination that you didn't expect, but it makes sense. But on Guru's verse, he sounds like he literally phoned it in. We'll talk about that more in the next dimension. Then you have Freddie Fox who at this point in time had made his bumpy knuckles 
alias well known his connection with Premier is well known at this point too his name is bubbling again in the underground circuit this was his Capadonna moment his cannabis moment he gets a super long verse and he goes in and to me it was a defining moment because it proved that age does not matter skill surpasses and prevails above all and for me being someone who only knew freddie fox from his flavor unit days and just got reacquainted with him through the oc album shout out to oc uh this was a big moment in hip-hop i remember this not getting hip-hop quotable but getting its moment in the sunshine uh from all different kinds of hip-hop spaces where people were like pointing out the lines, the cleverness of Freddie Fox's verse on Militia. He was the standout verse on that song. Then of course you have Casey and Jojo on Royalty, who, you know, Primo said they were highly sought out because they were someone that he and Guru always wanted to work with for a project. They figured this is the right time. It's one of those pairings where it helped the duo get radio play without seeming like they were going for radio play. Sometimes acts get with singers for that extra mainstream boost. And this didn't seem like it, it seemed a bit organic. It seemed like the compromise also, because the bigger label is expecting you to do something. How do you stay true to yourself while giving the label something they can work with for the, the machine? Last but not least, the most talked about guest appearance on this album the unexpected arrival of Inspector Deck. Now, in other Wu-Tang related episodes, I've talked about how Deck had the misfortune of being the Wu member who was supposed to have one of the first albums out the gate that got destroyed and wound up having one of the last solo albums out the gate that people were really checking for. And, you know, when I think about his moment in the light in the year 1998, he did have a really great setup based on the guest features that he started getting outside of the clan. This being the defining one because it was unexpected. No one saw it coming. Uh, Premier mentioned on his backstory episode of this track that Guru originally wanted Rayquan and Ghostface, which makes sense. They were the most street level uh, members of Wu-Tang at that point based off the successes of their solos that it came out. The, the years prior here. But at the last minute, one of their affiliates suggested Deck and they made it happen. And this is where the 5% talk and the God body knowledge comes to a resounding peak and, and a beautiful balanced space on a track like this where both Guru and Deck are weaving it into their verses in ways that just sound like beautiful poetic language on a hypnotic, airy hip hop beat that just sucks you in, but not losing the listener. It's like you understand all the references. Deck is doing very woo foundational kind of talk on his, while Guru's going straight into his enlightenment bag, and it works. And you know the the topic is said to have been when Deck asks, "What's the song about?" Guru said, "Your mental." And you get that, but it's so much more. It's the unexpected gem. Um, people talked about this and talk about this track to this day. This was a defining moment for Deck and for Gangstar. Uh, so all these features are something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats if you're thinking about if they help or hurt the album. Dimension seven. The question of does the weakest song or do the weakest songs bring the album down? Okay. Now we talked about the cohesiveness being pretty solid. We talked about Premier's production having range. And we talked about all the guests kind of bringing an elevated presence because of the importance that rhyming over Premier tracks gives these verses. But can't always save a song. Now, one thing I will say about the songs, especially if you bought this album on cassette, like I had it, shout out to all my tape buyers out there. There is a degradation in effort that seems to happen on some tracks. On some tracks, you can tell when Guru is in his bag, 
and really testing out flows and putting energy behind stuff and others where he just is kind of doing some filler things right so it's a track like work where you hear him riding up the beat in a bouncy cadence you can tell there was some push there i mentioned his verse on bi versus friendship compared to what he did on betrayal where he just sounds like he's talking he's dragging the rhyming line out some lines don't rhyme no oomph to it and some amateurish things that happen and so you get a track like next time and primo said that in memory of and next time were the last two songs made for the album and they just happened to be the last two songs in sequence of the album and it shows Guru goes off beat on next time so many times it sounds rushed there's no riding of that track and then if you don't like certain features you know I go back to the Jojo and KC KC you know is a strong voice on any track especially on a hip hop track if you are not ready for it Jojo is more standard sound he's in the alto range and he's just kind of doing what most singers would do on a track like that but it all comes down to do you want to hear singing on a gang star song fair enough that's the only track where that happens if you don't like beats that are too long you know betrayal goes on for a long time that beat rides out uh after scarface's verse is done but some people love it because you get to vibe out that beat is a very mood inducing beat so just like she knows what she wants. I remember as a kid, I used to think she knows what she wants is too slow and too sappy. As a grown up, especially as a grown man, I appreciate what that song does. There's one interlude that comes at the beginning of the rep grows bigger with one of their female associates talking in the beginning of the track for way too long and a little bit annoying. I know it's Women's History Month, but could do without that. I wish that was a little bit more skippable. So all these things are something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. It's always up to you. Takes us to dimension eight, mass appeal. Right, we just talked about the Casey and Jojo idea. Uh, I mentioned how it seemed like an organic enough pairing. Primo said he knew what he was doing when he was trying to capture the vibe of that song. I feel like it was a, a pretty genuine compromise you can't just deliver an album in a year like 1998 where people are doing big platinum numbers and expect to just be just gritty for the whole album and plus that's never been gang stars frame they give you songs like love sick and dwick and x to the next they have fun with their songs as well it's not all suckers need bodyguards it's it's a mix Premier talks about the making of this video, and I didn't realize this when I was younger. The video for this was so innovative, as most Gangstar videos have been throughout their history. And they turned a New York City turnstile area for the main, for the super massive MTA crazy system that we have out there. Um, they got permits to shoot inside train cars and turn an area where the turnstile and toll booth is into a nightclub setup. They had a bar, they had people partying around this area with the lights and everything. And I didn't even notice it until I took another look at the video. So super duper, uh, just ingenious kind of uh, thoughts and ideas. You know, they were able to get their cameos. There's strategic things done that tell me that they knew that this was their radio shot even though the lead single was, you know, my steez. And if you want to go even further back from that, you can count work as the unofficial street single because that's bleeding over from the soundtrack to the movie Caught Up, which I saw in theaters, by the way, with my dad. Um, but shout out if y'all seen that. It's like a weird hood underground cult classic. So uh, doesn't mean it was a good movie. I'm just putting it out there. But Joaquin Woodbine, right? Cindy Williams. And... Because that had like this head start as a single, people got used to the song work from the mixed shows and circuits. I certainly heard it 
on all the underground rap stations and just regular mix shows. That kind of wet people's appetite because that, again, was an energetic guru in his bag. He had flow, he had lines, there was cleverness, the beat is upbeat. And Primo said that the people behind the soundtrack acts for a lighter, more up-tempo offering from Gangstar and that's what was delivered. So you have that, you know my steez, which is a real mid-tempo, real light song. It's not intended for the club. It's one of the last years you can get a song like that off at radio, and that's what it did. It got soft rotation play. It was in regular rotation, and it was on the mix shows. All the backpack spots were definitely playing it but royalty was their big play. With that, you hear Guru do things like shout out Bugsy, who was a prominent figure on radio, but kind of aging out towards the older audience, Red Alert, Sway and Tech, and Funk Master Flex to make your head jerk. So pretty much squeezing in as many names he could in one bar to cover the LA market and the New York market when it comes to urban radio or stations and DJs who would at least play Gangstar. When rappers do moves like that, they might tell you it's 100% from the heart. I'd say it's probably 50%. Yes, I'm shouting you out because I like you, but this is also a little insurance that I'll get a spin or two, right? So strategic things like that, the beat has that thump, it has the knock that it needs to, to be authentic hip hop feeling while giving you the chiminess of something that's recognizable and softer. They didn't try to hijack the sound that was popular at the time. They stayed true to themselves. JoJo and Casey are not in the video, but this song got regular rotation. This was being played right next to everything else that was being played in 1998, regular daytime airplay. Uh, and I thought that was an impressive feat for a group like Gangstar to be played right after DMX. <laughs> so you have work as the unofficial street single that bubbles and generates buzz. You get, you know, my steez as the lighter radio offering, royalty as the Hail Mary radio offering, and then you can do what you want by the third single because you're rounding things out. You get the Militia and Militia had a video. This is where you're seeing Freddie Fox in this new bumpy knuckles iteration. You're getting to put a name to the face of Suge and Suge has his single bubbling out the year prior around the same time, Crush. And uh, the, the launching pad is there. MOP's name was popping and within the album itself uh, above the clouds being that outlier song the album cut that got as popular as a single you're also getting slight buzz if you're in the know hearing guru address his legal issues and then there are songs where they touch on lighter things so like the song about the mall the song she knows what she wants there are songs talking about dating life and you know softer tones and things for appeal while keeping it gangstar. There's 5% language, but they're not alienating other people. And the promo for this, because they have the new label behind them and they had recently switched from the now defunct Chrysalis Records to the straight Virgin New Tribe roster, they're getting snipes put up on cities. They're getting commercials. They're getting full page ads in the magazines at the time. All that stuff matters because visibility is the currency in the 90s. We didn't have social media. In the early and mid 90s, they were a major act. And at this point, they're considered underground. So they were the underdogs and they beat the odds. Uh, they squeezed brilliance out of a 20 track album and got what they were gonna get. When I think about what else could have been a single off of this album, then uh, it becomes a little trickier because I just don't know what else had legs like that. All of this is something to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. When you're thinking about the massive pill that takes us to dimension nine, my favorite, the three eyes, impact, innovation, influence. All right. The impact of this album is that it winds up being Gangstar's most successful album to date. Like I said, the end of a run for 90s albums that made them 
a consistent monster in the game and they rounded it out with a bang. This winds up going gold, going gold within the same year, within the same season, actually. It's able to generate those three videos and be buzzed and talked about the hip hop quotable helps. And there's so many hip hop quotable moments from this album that it keeps it cemented in, in like amber <laughs> uh, of being talked about to this day. Again, the Freddie Fox versus talked about, the Crumb Snatcher versus talked about, the Inspector Deck versus talked about. And overall, people talked about the way that Guru came back pretty hard on the tracks where it felt like reinvigorated Guru on a lot of the songs here. And when you're thinking about how the Gangstar story unfolded, unfortunately, uh, some of the, the murkiness, the question marks, uh, Guru's passing, rest in peace to Guru, by the way, uh, all of it makes this a uh, beautiful moment that fans want to cement in time. And this is how we want to remember Gangstar because this album introduced the group to the new generation of heads who were only tuned in to this new wave that 1998 was bringing. And it was like validation for all the early 90s and late 80s heads who really came up on Gangstar and were waiting for these comebacks. Seeing our golden era rappers prevail and, and do what they were supposed to do felt like a win for all those fans and listeners from that era. Uh, it really was a bridging album to the point where it still played in the underground spaces. And I think a lot more people know this because of the commercial success than even even expected at the time. I think for uh, an act that only wanted their respect is being able to drop a consistent album, but winding up getting their first gold plaque and going on to do even bigger things later. That's the impact. Innovation on this album, if you are a producer and you've become accustomed to the MPC in any fashion, some of the things that Premier did with the production work, the patterns on here, I can see how that would be innovative. Otherwise, Mm, nothing new is being brought to the table because they want to reestablish the game star formula. So there's nothing that I could say is blatantly innovated on this album. Uh, just the formula is perfected. I mentioned how it introduced new premier sounds and familiar premier sounds. So this was just kind of the beginning of a new chapter for Primo to go on and now double the workload that he was doing for outside acts and, and other artists. Um, since Gangstar took a nice little break after this one as well. So it just cemented, hey, I can do this dopeness for my duo and I can do this dopeness for you and it's all going to be the same. I'm not one of those producers that just saves his best stuff for his own duo and gives people like the, the scrappy stuff. So that helps when you're trying to forge a legacy of being one of the best and Primo is indeed known as one of the best. The influence, Premier, I, I, don't, I don't know if Guru's influence uh, is direct in any way. I think this album is influential in the way that you'll hear other rappers point to it somewhere in the canon of albums that made them want to write, that inspired them, that has a song that made them want to be a, a rapper, something to that effect. Even though Guru has memorable lines on here, just the fact that Guru was addressing his personal issues on wax, you know, and saying lines like, this grown man will make mistakes no longer. I don't know if anyone will say it's because of Guru's writing, but maybe you see something that I don't. This is all something for you to consider on a scale for one to five heartbeats. That takes us to the final dimension, dimension 10. The overall timelessness and uniqueness of this album. Where does it fit in the pantheon of classics? This is a 1998 album by Golden Age Group that came back from a four year hiatus and was using a more mature sound while still giving you new sounds and familiar sounds. It's just, um, it's a cohesive effort and none of the beats have yet to feel dated because again, they didn't ride any waves of the time, any trends that were out. There was no Suave House remix. There was no Swiss beats. 
uh, remix is all in-house production, all musical, even when chopping up those MPC samples. And some of the slang, because Google is using a, a mix of slang that carried from older years and newer years, I don't even know if you could fault the slang for being outdated. You know, you might say Dilsnick uh, or something like that. I remember seeing the title when I learned that this was going to be the lead single and thinking Steez. Nobody says Steez anymore. It had been played out by that point in time, especially the full version of that slang word, Stilo. And I was like, ah, oh, this ain't going to hit. But it did what it was supposed to do. This remains an album that's talked about because, like I said, I think the critics and the fans have sealed it in amber and it's been unscathed because of that. It's one of those albums that generates some kind of warmth in listening to it, but that is all in the eye of the beholder or the ear of the beholder. And on that note, that's something for you to consider on a scale from one to five heartbeats. And that's how we'll conclude this category one review of the classic Moment of Truth by Gangstar. Join me for video two, where we go over category two, which is going to be the rap performance on this album. We'll really break down Guru's approach to the songs on here. In the meantime, I want to just revel in the fact that we have been around for two years and y'all have been rocking with me. Go tell a friend, tell a friend, the more the merrier, more followers, more subscribers, more life, more interviews, and we just gonna keep getting better. And until then, Y'all know what it is. F a rap critic. They talk about it while I live it. Word to mouth.